Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. It's no secret that abortion rights are under attack across America. But to say that is to establish too narrow a framework for the critical issues at hand. The simple fact is that right-wing politicians, religious zealots, and conservative activists have been waging a long-running, brutal, mean-spirited, and sometimes murderous assault on the rights and health of American women and girls. And this assault has dire implications for the health of American democracy. I only wish that what I'm saying here were hyperbole. We'll talk about this crisis and what can be done about it with my guest, Jennifer Weiss Wolf, the executive director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network at the NYU School of Law. She's also the executive director for strategy at Ms. Magazine and a former vice president and fellow at NYU Law's Brennan Center for Justice. Wow, that is a mouthful. <laughs> Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here with you. Um, so let's just start with the, um, the basics. The uh, Supreme Court over overturned Roe Ro v. Wade, um, I guess it was near the end of June. And um, that sort of demolished a constitutional right, not sort of, it did demolish a constitutional right to abortion that stood for nearly half a century. So if you'd be good enough to explain that ruling and the reasoning of the six, six to three majority of the court. Yeah, we actually had sort of a one-two punch in getting to hear about it too, if you remember the decision right. was leaked uh, several weeks before the actual opinion was issued, um, in which the majority of the court, now six to three, um, overruled Roe versus Wade. They basically held that the 14th Amendment right to privacy that had been established through Roe and other right. cases around that time just didn't exist. Um, and they revoked it entirely and they sent the decision back to the states. Uh, they claimed, Justice Alito claimed in the majority that this was a political question and that was where it belonged in the states where voters could have their say. Uh, we can talk about that a little later, what this same court has actually done to eviscerate uh, the right to participate and be heard, yeah. um, to make that really a very cruel irony to, to make that point. Um, but overall, yes, the right to privacy as we've known it um, and lived it, many of us, for our entire lives, for yeah. a half a century, um, is now no longer. Um, there are open questions about what that means for other decisions that have been uh, ruled upon using those same privacy uh, considerations, whether it's contraception, whether it's right to marriage, um, and that's, that's kind of the part two and part three that are down the line. But for the here and now, the immediate impact of the court's ruling in the Dobbs decision is to um, make it such that there is no national standard right. and no national right to abortion. And Clarence Thomas addressed that. He said uh, specifically, the, the, the court, I guess it was Alito who said that this really just applies to abortion. And Clarence Thomas is saying that the oh, same no, reasoning no. should apply yes. to other cases as, as well. Yeah, the, the, the majority and, and other concurring opinions seem to go out of their way a little bit to, to try to quell the, the fears in the streets that that is really where we're headed. Right. And, and Justice Thomas said, nope, yeah. that is exactly where I want us headed. Right, and interesting that Thomas um, uh, did not mention interracial marriage, which is covered by this the, the, the ban, uh, actually the ban on the bans against interracial uh, marriage. Um, is based on that same reasoning, those same rights to privacy. And he talked about addressing, I guess it was um, gay rights, gay marriage, some other issues, but he didn't mention interracial he marriage. Very he very much left out loving versus Virginia. He, of course, Virginia. is in a, an interracial marriage, so I, I thought that was curious. Um, since this uh, ruling by the court, um, there's been a predictable rush in many states uh, to enact laws uh, blocking access to uh, abortions. Can you talk about how widespread uh, that rush has been and, and what kind of restrictions we're seeing? 
Yeah, it's, it's very hard to keep up with because um, understandably there's also a legal fight to challenge uh, those restrictions in the states. Right now, I believe the current count is 13 states that have outlawed abortion entirely um, and another dozen or so have restrictions in place that would have been unconstitutional under Roe. Some of those, um, for example, like in Ohio, um, I believe the ban is 20 weeks or 22 weeks um, and the, the six-week ban that they the legislature passed was stayed by the court just last week. Um, so some of them are kind of in flux and in a constant state of play. Uh, there, are, there are many trackers online from media sites, from advocacy organizations, keeping track day to day, but it's really an ever-changing landscape. So um, what happens, so if, if a state uh, has uh, banned abortions or effectively banned abortions, um, what happens to, to to the women in that state who who want uh, and or need an an abortion? Um, they can go out of state, I imagine, if they can afford it. Sometimes it would be um, a great distance. But are the states also trying to, or are some states also trying to block that? I mean, are they trying to reach beyond their borders? Yeah, I mean, the real-time effects, we're only even starting to just see really how dire it's going to be. Um, so, yes, as you point out, many of these states that, um, are, that, are, that are still providing abortions already had in place other restrictions that have been, you know, part of the political game over the past 50 years, whether it's waiting periods, whether it's parental consent, um, and then add to that now that there is a much larger, um, you know, uh, trail of people who were seeking their services coming from nearby states. So if those states were only able to handle X number of patients prior, you know, the, the number of people seeking their services has increased exponentially. And those are folks who can afford to travel, who can afford to take the time to travel. Um, traveling isn't just the cost of the train ticket or the bus ticket or the plane ticket or the gas. It's also potentially lodging in food because right. you're, you know, having to go eight hours, 10 hours. It's child care. It's, it's all of the things that just, it's time off of work. It's the things that exist in people's lives. So that aspect of it has just become exponentially harder uh, than it was in the first place. Um, and that's, again, that's for the folks who can afford and live close enough to the states um, that where abortion is still accessible to be able to make those decisions. So let's talk a little bit about some of the real world consequences of uh, bans on abortion. Um, and we're already starting to see uh, some of those consequences uh, occur. Uh, what are some of the, and now I'm talking about the sort of the most serious aspects of it, sometimes even tragic aspects of it. What are the kinds of things uh, that we're seeing and, and that we're likely to continue seeing? Yeah, so, you know, in the weeks and, and months that have followed uh, the Dobbs ruling, we've seen sort of headlines um, about very uh, disturbing circumstances. A 10-year-old who was impregnated in Ohio while the six-week ban was in effect there and right. when the pregnancy was discovered was six weeks and three days pregnant and had to be taken out of state um, to, to obtain an abortion. And, and really sort of all of the awful discourse that followed it. People asked actually whether it could be proved that she was really raped, as if a 10-year-old is anything but raped <laughs> if she is pregnant. Exactly. Um, so there have been circumstances of women who are carrying unviable fetuses, fetuses with, without a skull forming, um, who are denied um, abortions if their lives aren't in danger at the moment, right. um, if, they're, if they're not near dying enough. Her stories of women who already have been just, you know, their doctors are struggling with are, are, they, are they near death enough for me to provide the medical care that they need at this moment? Um, so those are just sort of a small handful. I was reading an article yesterday, really interestingly, about older mothers and how many of the diagnostic tests that are required for, for them to, for wanted pregnancies um, they don't receive results until 16, 18 weeks into their pregnancy. But in these states, not, o not only were pregnant, um, where abortion is outlawed, but where it's outlawed at 15 weeks or 18 weeks, that's still leaving them in really tragic circumstances. Right. Um, I think one of the, one of the narratives or, or the storytelling that's emerged 
during this, this time since June has not been that the world is filled with women who want abortions and women who don't, women who want to be pregnant right. and women who don't, but there's this huge gray area in between for people whose, whose health is implicated by certain pregnancies, um, by all pregnancies, by medication they need that happens to be adjacent to pregnancy. So there have been stories about women who need um, treatment for cancer, treatment for diabetes, who are being denied it, either because they're pregnant, or because they might become pregnant. It's, it's just so widespread. And I think that where the, the political winds are beginning to shift is that people who might have assumed themselves outside of this, you know, this, this boundary of people who need abortions or don't are realizing that they actually fall in that. If right. there are anyone who may be pregnant or have a daughter or spouse or, or sibling or friend who may become pregnant and truly, truly endangered by that pregnancy, these laws impact everybody. Right, we're starting to see coverage of um, the implications of abortion bans that people tended to look at kind of starkly when in fact there are all kinds of complex ramifications um, and it can affect people as you point out who um, w women who are not pregnant who are not seeking an abortion but uh, still adversely affected by these bans you had mentioned you mentioned a, a moment ago um, states with uh, six-week bans and Texas even before um, the Dobbs ruling uh, had enacted a, a ban on abortions after six weeks. And at the time, the Texas Governor Greg Abbott told the press, this is a quote, obviously this provides at least six weeks for a person to be able to get an abortion. In other words, he thinks you can make a decision in those first six weeks and you can choose whether to have an abortion or not. In his view, that means there is, you have access to abortion. You pointed out very clearly that that is not true. It's not obvious that you have six weeks to make a decision. Explain what you meant. Okay, so Texas, Texas is, is like a whole kettle of fish here. <laughs> so let's, we can go back to a year ago, September uh, 2021, when a six-week ban went into effect in Texas that had this sort of diabolical setup whereby it wasn't, abortion wasn't outlawed by the state, but it enabled private citizens to um, bring uh, civil actions against anyone they believed to have helped somebody obtain an abortion. And they could receive a reward, a financial reward for doing so, $10,000, which created this sort of bounty hunter circumstance. On the day that that law went into effect and the Supreme Court did nothing, so we should also just stop and remember that the people of Texas, 10% of this nation's population, have been without the protections of Roe versus Wade since September 2021, not June 2022. But on the day that that law, SB 8, went into effect, and it's still in effect, by the way, as Texas has also otherwise outlawed abortion uh, through a trigger law that automatically went into effect um, after the Dobbs ruling. But on the day that SB 8 went into effect last uh, fall, Governor Abbott stood on the steps and said just what you said. Um, now, you happen to have not just somebody who thinks about abortion and democracy, but someone who thinks a lot about menstruation sitting in this chair. And one of the things that I know from doing advocacy around menstruation across the country with state legislators, it's like Governor Abbott, a lot of our legislators don't know much about it. So when Governor okay. Abbott said, six week ban means six weeks to get an abortion, he was patently wrong because pregnancy is counted from the day a person's the last period happened, not the day of the missed period. Right. So on the day of the missed period, presumably someone is around four weeks pregnant. Could be a little bit more depending on how their body works. And if they are four weeks pregnant under a six week ban, that means they have two weeks to get an abortion, not six. Um, unfortunately, I think what Governor Abbott said is something that other politicians might believe they just think pregnancy starts being counted from the moment somebody knows they're pregnant, which is, again, not true. But I think everyday people might think that, too. We have pretty abysmal right. sex ed in this country, um, and that's just not a commonly known or talked about aspect of our lives in any event, but it's absolutely deadly now. 
uh, for people not to have that information. So if there's any takeaway from our talk, I would love for people in states to know, especially if you're in a six week ban state, that means you have two weeks to get an abortion from the day you find out you're pregnant, if in fact you have a 28 day cycle and you find out on the first day. And the same math applies obviously for other bans too. You're four weeks pregnant, roughly speaking, on the day that you discover you're pregnant. So it's effectively a ban on abortion. It's effective, six week ban is effectively a ban on abortion. Right. For, for the most resourced among us, two weeks is nearly impossible to right. get an abortion because of backlogs, because of travel, because of scheduling, because of everything in our universes, two weeks is almost no time to get an abortion. But just to be really clear, two weeks isn't six weeks. Right. Exactly. So you mentioned uh, menstruation, and, and this brings us to another point um, related to the ban on um, uh, the ruling on abortion, and that is that there's no guarantee now um, that a, that a woman's vital and very personal health information will remain private. And in, in other words, uh, all kinds of people have. Uh, access as a result of things um, like period tracking apps, uh, which you which you have written about. Uh, can you explain what they are and why period tracking apps have now become a potential vulnerability for women? Yes, and that's a great way to describe it, a potential vulnerability, because all of these things, um, the digital footprints that we leave um, and discussion even just about menstrual cycles is, is now can be weaponized. It doesn't mean it necessarily always will. So folks right. need to make their own decisions about what they're comfortable with. Um, but they absolutely pose a vulnerability. So period tracking apps are one of the many ways our lives have a digital footprint um, and that we make personal and private information potentially available to folks who could use it to do harm. Um, so for period tracking apps, they are just that. They are, they're digital devices that enable you to enter information um, about your cycle, about moods, about body temperature, you name it. I mean, all the things that, that are part of how one would track that aspect of their lives. But the difference is that you're doing it online and you're actually creating something of an algorithm um, about your own existence. Right. You're creating a footprint um, about that if somebody really wanted to know if you became pregnant on a certain date um, or if you somehow missed a period, they would be able to obtain that information. Um, the information that is is garnered by apps has sort of, um, the apps the apps kind of run a wide gamut, let's say that, in terms of how they do business. So some actually enable you, and you, you can check certain privacy boxes, um, but enable your information to be aggregated and sold to advertisers, um, to, to other to other marketing opportunities. Um, some enable you to click off you know, certain boxes to have protection, but then it also depends on how that app is storing that information. If it's stored on the cloud, for example, um, it can be subject to a subpoena by law enforcement. Um, even if it's on your own phone and not on sort of a, a, a broader um, a platform, it could still be the subject of a search warrant. So right. none of this, quite frankly, in the period tracking app has come to any sort of dystopian reality at the moment. When the Dobbs, when the leak decision came down, a tweet went viral saying, everybody delete your period tracking apps. Um, and a lot of folks pointed out that there are other ways that our private information, Google searches, using your credit card to buy certain items at the CVS drugstore, pregnancy tests or otherwise, are also part of that algorithm. And some of them pose more danger perhaps than period tracking apps. But the truth of the matter is, is we're living in kind of a wild legal west now yeah. for what this is all going to look like. I have kids of the age who would be using apps like that and I've advised them not to use them. Right. I will say that I also worry, just like we talked about a few moments ago about people's own literacy and body literacy, I do worry that they don't have access to the kind of information and education they need. And period tracking apps might have filled that gap for them. And I want them to be able to understand how pregnancy works and how to avoid pregnancy and all of the things that you know matter so much also in this new era. So it's complicated, I think, is the answer. Do it, don't do it. Um, Everything has, has a risk. And like you said, everything has a vulnerability. And we do know that there are people out there who are looking for clues 
trying to find out who may be trying to access an abortion, uh, what medical personnel or, or other uh, health professionals um, uh, might be uh, involved in advising women on abortion rights and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so. I mean, that's already happening too. The criminalization of pregnancy outcomes is a reality in this country, and there are already women who have been arrested, detained, and incarcerated um, for pregnancy outcomes. And like you said, there are an array of individuals now and actors who have access to that information from their doctors to their coaches. There was an article recently about a soccer team, I think, in Florida where we're providing a full menstrual um, tracking opportunity was required to wow. participate in that sports team. Um, and again, for nefarious purposes, maybe, maybe not, hard to say, but we know now that the dangers are just too real and there are risks that many, many of us don't want to bear. Um, I think a, a very important um, aspect of this story, um, which is maybe not getting enough coverage, uh, but which you've been all over, is that this isn't just about abortion. It's also about the systematic undermining of our democracy, which actually has been underway for a, a long time prior to this court ruling or, or even the specific most recent debates about uh, abortion. Um, but you've argued persuasively that abortion rights and women's rights are directly tied to the health of American democracy. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, and that's it's such an important piece of the story right now because it, it is it is our future, and this is where we all play a part um, in what comes next. And that is that the the very structures of our systems of democracy, how we participate, where when we vote, um, who represents us in our state legislatures, in Congress, who's sitting on the courts that hear our cases. All of that is obviously a huge piece of the story about abortion rights and privacy rights and women's rights and equality rights. Right. Um, and we are seeing an utter demise of those in those country in our country. Um, the, the United States, for the first time, was listed as a backsliding democracy um, last year by a European think tank by you know various metrics for yep. participation and transparency and engagement. Um, and that's everything from gerrymandered political districts to vote suppression um, to this, these attacks sort of on the integrity yep. of our elections and this notion of not even being able to know who won and counting the votes. Um, Texas, once again, is sort of our case in point. <laughs> Always Texas. Always Texas. Um, of a state that who where gerrymandering practices in the last site redistricting cycle led to a circumstance where the people's will is not represented right. in the state legislature. Um, and why we're seeing laws like the SB 8 um, go into effect and why we're seeing a court, um, not just the Supreme Court, um, but courts all across right. the country um, where the judicial selection is also part of the um, degraded status yep. of our democracy and you know who's in the positions of power to to make those placements um, is, is just it's part of how we got here and it's part of where we're at. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left but um, I'd like to talk about um, what can be done that you, you, you know um, uh, it is a crisis, it's a, it's, a, it's a growing crisis, but there are also people um, all over the country who, who are fighting back uh, against this. If you were addressing a group of ordinary citizens, including young people, um, who wanted to do whatever they could um, uh, to sort of um, uh, advance the, the, the health and other rights of women in this country, what would you recommend that they do? How would you suggest that they become engaged? I love that question. I have, I have two answers. One, that's very specific to the circumstance that we're in for, around abortion rights in this country, and that is really to get involved locally. 
Um, and that includes if you live in a blue state where you think right. where you think you know everything is safe. Here in New um, York. Here in New York, first of all, there are things we're doing here in, that, that our legislators and leaders are doing here in New York to make New York a safer place for other folks who need to come here to access abortion services. Um, but to really get local about it, and if that means adopting an abortion fund or clinic in another state and providing a regular flow of of financial support. Um, and other support to the folks who've been doing this on the ground around the country for many, many years. That is a great place to get started and a great place to to put your, your energy and your commitment. <laughs> um, don't try to recreate the wheel. There are folks who've been right. doing it all around the country. But on the sort of broader question for democracy, beyond the obvious vote, um, it's also really understand what's at play in all of the elections happening in your state down to who is running for your local school yeah. board, um, who is running for state office. Um, so many of the, the political questions before us are actually happening at the local and state level, uh, not just the laws that are being passed that impact your state, but who's going to be um, determining the outcomes of those elections, um, who is going to be deciding what the kids in your community are taught, what they read. Um, so to really pay attention at all of those levels and get involved at those levels, they're somehow a little less sexy or a little less, you know, they feel a little <laughs> less important. You can always have your eyes on the, you know, the top line prize, um, but that's really where the democracy fights are at. That's fantastic. Um, we are, we've run out of time. Uh, much to my chagrin, uh, but thank you so much for being here. We've been uh, talking with Jennifer Weiss Wolf. Um, I'm Bob Herbert. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.